Hi, this is Teresa Wyatter. This presentation is about Mount St. Helens. And I decided to do a program on Mount St. Helens because this year represents the 40th anniversary of the eruption. Where is Mount St. Helens? Let's take a look at a map of the United States. And on the right where the green star is, is where we live in New York State. If you go all the way across the United States to Washington, you will find Mount St. Helens. It's part of the Cascade Mountain Range. Now here's a larger map of the West Coast. You will see the state of Washington. Oregon is below it and California is below Oregon. Up to, on the top is British Columbia, which is part of Canada. And in this circle is the Cascade Mountain Range. And here you will find many mountains and volcanoes. Right where this arrow is, that red triangle is Mount St. Helens. In order to understand what happened with Mount St. Helens, we need to take a look at the layers of the Earth. Now, here's a picture of the Earth. Right in the middle, the yellow is the inner core. The orange is the outer core. The red is the mantle. And on the very edge is the crust, or lithosphere. Plate tectonics plays an important role when it comes to earthquakes and volcanoes. If you take a look at a hard-boiled egg when it's cracked, that represents what the Earth looks like with plate tectonics. Along these cracks are the edges of the plates, and it's in the mantle where there is movement which causes earthquakes and volcanoes. Plate tectonics. Here is a picture of the world, and the red lines represent the edges of the plate. And there are many different kinds of plates. There is North American plate, South American plate, the African plate, Arabian plate, Eurasian plate, Indo-Australian plate, and the Antarctic plate. You also have plates in the water. Here's the Pacific plate the Caribbean plate, the Nazca plate. Over on the far right is the Fiji plate. But is, it is this plate right here, the Juan de Fuca plate, that plays an important part when it comes to Mount St. Helens. All of these plates move. And there are three major types of plate movement. When plates come together, push together, they converge. And just like this picture, they push together and form mountains. If they pull apart, it's called diverging. And when the plates pull apart, the hot magma creates new land forms. Or they can transform, and that's when two plates slide against each other. Let's take a look at the West Coast. Here is the Pacific Plate, and that the Pacific Plate is moving in a northwest direction. Then you've got the North American Plate, and that is moving in a southwest direction. And then the Juan de Fuca plate, that is moving in an easterly direction. And let's take a look at this picture right here. Here's a North American plate moving west. The Juan de Fuca plate that is moving east. And they're called converging plates. But the Juan de Fuca plate is also moving under the North American plate, and we call that subduction, when one plate moves under another.
Let's take a look at the ring of fire. Here is the map of the world. That red dotted line you see is what's called the ring of fire. All along these plates is where earthquake happens and there are a lot of volcanoes. Each triangle represents a volcano on the ring of fire. And this orange triangle right here is Mount St. Helens. There are over 160 active volcanoes in the Ring of Fire. Let's take a look at the parts of a volcano. Here's a diagram at the very bottom. You've got the magma chamber. A vent is where the magma spews out. Once the magma comes outside the volcano, it is called lava. You've got a crater in the volcano, which is the opening at the top, and then lots of ash also comes out of a volcano. There are three kinds of volcanoes when we describe them by shape. There is a shield volcano, a cinder cone volcano, and a composite volcano. Let's take a look at shield volcanoes. They're very low. They look like a shield down on the ground. They are wide and flat. Their eruptions are quiet. And mainly they just flow lava. And this is how the Hawaiian Islands were created. Another picture of a shield volcano you can see as the magma comes up, the lava just flows out to create more land. Here is a lava flow in Hawaii, another lava flow. This is interesting. Once the lava flows into the water, it hardens, and there's a brave kayaker going up to the lava flow. Here's a man standing on the road as the lava comes toward him. The lava moves very slowly. Here's another person in front of their house probably. It has not gotten at to the house yet. The house is up on stilts, but I don't know if that house will go up in flames. That is one danger, just like this house right here. Unfortunately, the lava made contact with the house. The house went up in flames. Here's an aerial view. On the left, you can see a house that is going up in flames. On the right is another house with a pool. Don't know if that one will be saved or not. Cinder cone volcanoes. They're the simplest kind. Their eruptions spew lava. The lava cools and particles break into cinders and small rocks. Here's a diagram and another diagram that shows the cinders. Composite volcanoes, they have very steep sides. They are very explosive and very dangerous. And out spews lava, ash, and rock. Here's another diagram. You can see the magma chamber at the bottom, and out is spewing lava, rock, and ash. Mount Fuji is a composite volcano as was Mount Vesuvius, and Mount St. Helens is a composite volcano. And there she is. There are different stages of volcanoes. You have active volcanoes, which erupt regularly. You have dormant volcanoes that are called sleeping volcanoes. They have not had activity for many years. And then you have extinct volcanoes. They were active at one time, but over the course of 10,000 years, they have not been active at all. Mount St. Helens, it is a composite volcano. It is an active volcano. And during the past 4,000 years, Mount St. Helens has erupted more frequently than any other volcano in the Cascade Range. In 1792, Captain George Vancouver named the volcano for Britain's ambassador to Spain, known as Baron St. Helens. 
Some history with Mount St. Helens. Between 1832 and 1857, Mount St. Helens has erupted. It puffed out clouds of steam and ash, small flows of lava, and then it fell asleep. Waking up. On March 1980, a 4.2 earthquake was felt on Mount St. Helens. And on April 27th, 1980, on the north side of the volcano, a massive bulge began to appear. It was measured to be about a mile in diameter. And there is the bulge right there. It's known as a cryptodome which is Greek for hidden or secret. And what caused it was rising magma deep below the surface, and it is pushing the igneous rock up. Scientists measured and they found it to be growing at about five feet per day. And on May 17, 1980, one day before the eruption, it was measured to be 450 feet. The Red Zone. There was a 20 mile radius around Mount St. Helens known as the Red Zone. Residents had limited access to this area. They had roadblocks in place because more eruptions meant more interest and more and more people wanted to see what was happening. And here is one roadblock that they had and another. There were two geologists that we need to make note of, Harry Glicken and David Johnston. And here's a picture of Harry Glicken. It was their job to take samples of ash and gases from the volcano. They had instruments to record earthquakes and the tilting of the ground. They had permission to be in the red zone and they were at the Cold Water II observation point. And from there, they relayed data of gases and movement for analysis. Dr. David A. Johnston, and there is a picture of him. He was a volcanologist, and he was quoted as saying, I just can't believe they're paying me to do this. He loved his job. He was at an observation point six miles away. And like I say, he was given permission to be there. And there was just a shift change with Harry Glicken just before the mountain erupted. Mount St. Helens eruption. It began on May 18, 1980. Here's a map and it shows that it was indeed on a Sunday at 8.32 a.m. Pacific time, which was 11.32 East Coast time. There was a 5.1 earthquake. And this is when David Johnston grabbed his microphone and yelled, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. And here is the first 832, the earthquake. Landslide begins in a downward slope. The landslide continues. And then a lateral blast begins. As the earthquake continues, the entire north slope slides away from the volcano. Some more interesting pictures. Ash, steam, and rock are blasted upwards. For over 10 hours, ash and smoke billowed into the air and across the United States. After 15 minutes, the vertical ash had reached over 80,000 feet. Quite an incredible picture. Here's another picture from a photographer. And these people stopped their car, got out and took a picture. It is awesome. Can you imagine being there? Here 
Here's a satellite picture that was taken from outer space. You can see Mount St. Helens, and then the plume of smoke that is slowly traveling across the United States. As a result of the explosion, day turned into night. Heavy ash clouds covered the sky. Here are two children that stopped to take a look. And the billowy clouds, what an eerie sight to see. Ash from the volcano was falling all over on the streets and the cars. People had to shovel ash from their cars and sidewalks, just like we would shovel snow. And in many places, it was very deep. People wore masks so they wouldn't inhale the ash. Firefighters also. Here's a police car. It had no filtration device, so they had to build one so the cars would continue to run during the ash fallout. And even dogs were protected. And somebody wrote on their car the exact date. The blast zone. Here's a picture. And you need to know that the arrow is pointing north. So Mount St. Helens erupted towards the north. The red is the lava dome. The crater wall, purple, is right around the lava dome. The blue is the lakes and streams in the area. The purple is the pyroclastic flow, and that is a dense collection of fragments, very hot ash and lava fragments and gases that explode from a volcanic eruption. And that flows down the slope of a volcano. The light green is blown down forest, and I'll show you some pictures in a bit. The dark green is scorched forests. The or light orange is the debris from the avalanche. The orange, dark orange, is the mud flow that happened. And right here is Spirit Lake. And we're going to talk about Spirit Lake and show you some pictures in a minute. Three minutes later, the lateral blast was up to 300 miles per hour, and it covered 230 square miles of forest. Right here is the lateral blast, and that is what blew sideways to the north. Here is a picture of the destruction of the forest. Another picture. And it looks like toothpicks that were just scattered on the ground. Here's an upturned tree. And if you take a look right where the end of this arrow is, there's a man standing there. Of course, this was photographed after the eruption. Here is a picture of fallen logs. And you can see right in the middle, there is a man. He makes a good size comparison to the logs and trees that were fallen. Here's another group of logs. Here's another man. He's standing on that huge tree that was fallen. Here's another picture of logs that were just pushed down the mountain. Here's a man standing next to the base of a tree. Pretty incredible. Again, more logs that had fallen. Some did remain. There was a great volcanic hazard that happened, and it is called a lahars. It's an Indonesian term for volcanic mud flow, and it's the consistency of wet cement. And when you've got water, melted ice, ash, dirt, rocks, debris all together, it forms a huge mud flow. 
And there's the results, the leftovers from the mud flow. Right here on the top of the trees shows where the mud flow, how high it had risen. And here in comparison is a person walking across the, on the land after it subsided. Now there's a little bit of discrepancy that I found during the research. At one time I found 27, another time 47 bridges were destroyed by this lahar and over 200 homes. Bob and John Brown. Here are the brothers trying to save their horses from the landslide and the mud flow. Unfortunately, they realized they could not save the horses and they, along with two friends, have decided to leave the area and save themselves. Here's a picture of a house in the middle of the lahar being swept down. Here's a picture of a bridge that was destroyed by the mud flow. This seems to be the top of a steel bridge that once stood. And here is a picture of a logging camp. When the mud flow roared through it, it overturned large pieces of equipment. And take a look here and here and here. These are all huge trucks that were overturned by the mud flow. Some photos of the destruction. Here is a car with the insides melted. Here is the hillside of the trees that were felled. And a lot of these trees were six feet in diameter. Here again is another picture of the trees. And if you take a look inside this green circle, you can see two men. And you can compare the size of the trees and the damage with the size of the men. Here's a man standing on the mud after it hardened. You can see how deep it goes. There's the sign that's supposed to be at the road. And here's a man on the top of the hardened mud near a bridge that was destroyed. After the eruption, searching took place for survivors. Here are two gentlemen, Don Swanson and Jim Moore, who took their helicopter and whenever they saw a car or perhaps camping equipment, they stopped to check to see if there were any survivors another helicopter searching for survivors and here is the army national guard pilot harold kolb he rescued two men and their son from a camping area jess hagerman in 1980 this is what he looked like he owned a helicopter, and between March and May of that year, he flew his helicopter over Mount St. Helens. And he saw cracks and steam and smoke coming out of those cracks. This is one of the pictures he took. Here's another picture that he took. And then it would go quiet. But the crater got larger and larger. After the eruption, he and his rescue crew saved almost 200 people from the area. And this is a picture of what he looks like today. Logging operations. Now, because the eruption happened on a Sunday, many lives were saved because the men who would usually work in the logging operations had the day off. And you can see here where the logs just destroyed the trucks that they would have been in. Another picture of destroyed trucks. And another picture. So all in all, it was fortuitous that the eruption happened on a Sunday because it saved many lives. 
The ash distribution. Here is the map of the United States, and this shows the fallout of ash along the United States. Right here in the green arrow is Mount St. Helens. The red shows that two to five inches of ash fell to the ground after the eruption. The orange, one half to two inches of ash was on the ground, and the yellow traced to one half. Now I can understand it being across the United States to the right, but it baffles me how the ash got to Oklahoma. In all, approximately 520 million tons of ash fell to the ground. There were two danger zones in the area of Mount St. Helens. The orange outline represents the red zone, and that was strictly off limits to the public. You can see the blue around that orange line, and that was the blue zone and only workers, loggers, were allowed to go into that area. Now on May 15th, the governor decided to extend the danger zone 20 miles northwest, as you can see by the arrows. Unfortunately, before that danger zone could be extended, the mountain exploded three days later. Casualties of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. 57 people were killed. Some died as a result of inhaling burning ash and hot gases. Some of them were buried under mud and ash. Here's a map of the victims and where they were found. The circles with the numbers in them represent the number of people that were found in that area. The danger zone, as I reported in the last slide, was not wide enough. You can see the red dotted line here. Well, this was 40 years ago. Geologists and scientists were uncertain of what the volcano would do. They didn't have the equipment that we have now. No one anticipated the strength of the volcanic blast. Logging companies were complaining because they were kept out of that area and they wanted to get in there. And as I said before, fortunately, it was on a Sunday and there were not many people in there working. The effects of the explosion. It was small by volcanic standards, but massive by human standards. And it was quoted to be the deadliest and most economically destructive volcanic event in the history of the United States. It was 500 times the force of the atomic bomb. Now here's a picture of Mount St. Helens erupting, and here is a picture of an atomic bomb exploding. Over 250 homes were destroyed, 15 miles of railway, and 185 miles of highway. Let's take a look at the downed trees. Yes, there's a picture of the trees along with the men in the corner, but 4 billion board feet were destroyed or damaged by the volcano that could be sold. A board foot is 144 cubic inches. And it could be 12 inch by 12 inch by one inch, which equals 144 cubic inches. That is one board foot. Or it could be 12 inches by six inches by two inches, 144 cubic inches. 25% of the destroyed trees were salvaged before they were rotted. And here's a picture of them salvaging some of the trees to be made into boards. So let's get back to Spirit Lake. Look at this gorgeous lake and the reflection of Mount St. Helens. This is a picture of it after. And 40% of the lake was covered with thousands of trees. 
and there is a man walking down. All of the logs that are in the water. Here's Harry R. Truman, an interesting gentleman, and we need to talk about him. He was born in 1896 in West Virginia. He owned a gas station in Washington later in his life. He was also a rum runner from San Francisco to Canada, and the police found out about him. And so he hid at Spirit Lake in 1926, where he opened a lodge. In 1930, he divorced his first wife. He remarried in 1935, but that marriage ended because every time they argued and he wanted to win the argument, he threw his wife in Spirit Lake. He married again and his third wife died in 1978. And that is when he closed the lodge. He was known for his pink Cadillac. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that. He swore, he drank, he hated Republicans, hippies, young children, and especially old people, which was quite ironic because he was 84 years old when the mountain erupted. Harry Truman, he was very unpredictable. And in 1953, this man came to the lodge. Well, Harry Truman looked out the window and said, tell the old coot that if he wants a cabin, we don't have any. His friends started to laugh because they said, don't you know who that man is? That man is Mr. Douglas, Mr. William O. Douglas, the Supreme Court Justice. He was a Democrat. And there he is on the Supreme Court. Well, Harry Truman ran after him once he found out who he was and told him to come on back. He had a room for him and they remained friends. Harry Truman, he opened Mount St. Helens Lodge on Spirit Lake. And there's a picture of the sign and there he is sitting outside on the steps of his lodge. He was one mile away from the volcano. He owned 16 cats. And there he is with some of his cats. He was told to evacuate. And he said, if the mountain goes, I go with it. I'm going down with my ship. He refused to move. Unfortunately, he was buried by the volcano. His house was buried under 150 feet of mud and ash. Here's a picture. And right here is the approximate site of Harry Truman's Lodge. Dr. David Johnston. Here's a picture of him. He was the volcanologist. He was six miles away from the volcano at the Cold Water II Observation Point. There's the observation point, and here is Mount St. Helens. At that time, he had just switched places with Harry Glicken for the morning switch. This is the last picture taken of David Johnston, and he was the one that yelled into his microphone, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it as the eruption began. And here's a paper article. Robert Landsberg. This was a very interesting story I found while I was doing research. This is what he looked like. He was a photographer. He was about two miles away from the mountain. And when the eruption began, he quickly took photos and rolled up the film back in the camera, put the camera back in the case, put the case in his backpack and laid on the backpack because he knew he would not be able to get out of the area in time. His body was found 17 days later along with his backpack. And in January 1981, National Geographic did a story on Mr. Landsberg and posted his last pictures that he took. Pretty incredible.
Here's a picture of Mount St. Helens before the eruption at 9,677 feet. After the eruption, it was at 8,363 feet. The red dotted line showing what the mountain used to look like with a difference of 1,314 feet. Coldwater Creek Observation Point where Harry Glicken and David Johnston watched and recorded data is now called Johnston's Ridge Observatory and Visitor Center, named after this man, David Johnston. Here is the Johnston Ridge Observatory, and here is Mount St. Helens Forest Learning Center, and both of these buildings are wonderful places in which to visit. Johnston Ridge Visitor Center and Mount St. Helens Forest Learning Center. Both areas have learning station. They have pictures, diagrams. Right here is where you can go underneath the quote unquote volcano. And inside there's a picture of the magma. Like I said, they have illustrations, pictures. There is a mammoth tree that they brought in as something to look at. Mount St. Helens. Johnston Ridge. This is what it looks like from outside. And the crowd of people that you see there, there is somebody there always giving lectures, talking about the mountain, answering questions. It's a beautiful place. And here is looking at the mountain. This is on the north side of the mountain. So you can see where the huge landslide took place. In 1982, the federal government, led by President Reagan, set aside 110,000 acres for the National Volcanic Monument. He established this area for research, education, and recreation. And many of the parts of the mountain were left alone for regeneration. In some areas, replanting of seedlings took place. Here is a picture of after the blast. Here is a picture of some of the seedlings being planted. And 15 years later, this is what it looked like. Take a look at the gentleman at the bottom of the picture, this shows how tall the trees have grown. So there has been some rejuvenation of the area. And certainly Mount St. Helens comes back to life. You can see green growing up, flowers pushing through the ash. There's Spirit Lake, and even animals return. When the volcano erupted, thousands upon thousands of animals were killed. Squirrels who lived underground were able to survive and come out again. There are deer, caribou, some eggs laid by either a bird or a reptile, and there's little creature underground peeking his head out. Before and after satellite images of the regeneration. Now this picture was taken in 1974. You can see it's green all around with the white. That is Mount St. Helens. Here's the 1980 right after the eruption and landslide. All the gray is the destruction. And then a picture taken from 2011. A lot of green is appearing again. You can still see Mount St. Helens, but the forest has been regenerating itself. Before and after. Here's Spirit Lake before and Spirit Lake after. Mount St. Helens before. Mount St. Helens after. 
On May 18, 2000, a memorial plaque was dedicated at the Hofstede Bluffs Visitors Center. It had the name of 57 people who perished when the explosion happened. Four were inside the restricted zone. One was David Johnston. There's his name right there. The other was Harry Truman, the man who refused to leave. There's his name there. And the other two that were inside the restricted zone was Bob Casewetter and Beverly Weatherald. They were amateur volcanologists taking readings near Spirit Lake, and they were there at their own risk. There is Bob's name right under David Johnston and Beverly's name. 37 years later, a logging truck. There's what's left of it. You can see a huge tree growing from the back of it and a tree growing from it looks like the cab of the logging truck. Here's a picture from the other side of the truck. And another picture that shows how this tree was blasted over and it fell onto the truck. There is new growth from this fallen tree. An A-frame house was found. Take a look at this picture that was taken shortly after the eruption. You can see how high the mud flow is. Many years later, someone put a fence up because people like to go see what's around. This A-frame house was in Kid Valley, Washington, over 23 miles from Mount St. Helens. Here's what it looked like inside the house. And if you look at the refrigerator, you can see how high the mud came. Bulldozers and trucks. Here's a picture of a bulldozer that was found after the eruption. All the mud and dirt, and you can see the green regenerating itself. Here's a truck that was found. You can see how high the mud flow came. There's still debris inside the truck and green growing all around it. Take a look at the tires here. This was interesting. These are brand new tires. Probably the truck was outfitted with the tires and was going to be used, but then the explosion happened. Before and after. Well, this would be the place where you would ask some questions. I'm sorry I can't be there to answer any of your questions, but still, perhaps when we see each other in the future, if you have a question, you can ask me then. Thank you so much for watching this presentation.